What happened to Misty Copsey? A story in three parts. This is part three, The Lies We Tell. A search party was scouring through the trees and ditches alongside Highway 410 in Washington when one volunteer stumbled across a shocking discovery. We dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. What searchers had discovered in the dimly lit woods had been something familiar to Diana, because it was something that belonged directly to her. A pair of acid-washed jeans. The same jeans her daughter Misty had borrowed to wear on her big night out at the Washington State Fair. This news did not bring joy for Diana, but rather it made her heart sink. Diana had always had a glimmer of hope, a hope that if Misty had run away, at least she was alive and probably safe. This discovery changed everything. Corey, on the other hand, was overjoyed at this development After Corey had spent years fighting with law enforcement about this case, he was vindicated. He was right. Corey was still waiting to stand trial on the drug charges, but this break in the case meant the police had to listen to him after all. At least, that's what Corey thought it meant. The genes were not the only thing found on this day. As the volunteer searcher plucked the genes from a ditch a pair of blue socks tumbled to the ground, followed by a pair of women's underwear. Diana confirmed that these were the clothing items Misty had been wearing the night she had vanished. With this new evidence in hand, Diana knew that Corey's claims were most likely true and that her beloved daughter was no longer of this world. The one good thing about where this evidence had been located was that it was technically within King County's jurisdiction. Now Detective Jim Doyen could take charge of the investigation of this area, and he did so by using a helicopter with infrared scanners to look for Misty's body. But her body was not located. When Detective Doyen first met Corey Bober, he was somewhat dubious of the civilian investigator. Doyen decided to hold back on his assessment of Corey. After all, he had produced results that the police had yet to accomplish. Detective Doyen was inquisitive about the evidence located during the search. The clothing was not located in the area where the other two bodies had been dumped. Both of the bodies had been just a ten-minute walk through the woods to each other, but the clothing was found in a ditch somewhat close to the roadway. Doyen knew that he had personally searched this area just the week prior, and he did not think these clothes had been present during his search, although he does acknowledge that they could have been overlooked. The clothes located were subjected to forensic testing, and the results were interesting, to say the least. The pants had been covered in dirt for an extended period of time, possibly buried and then unearthed and moved to the ditch following Corey's news story about their impending search of the area. When good old Sergeant Carver heard about the discovery of the clothing, he immediately thought of Diana and Corey, his old nemesis, and he thought it was possible that they were both involved in Misty's disappearance. All the while, he continued to proclaim that Misty was an average runaway. Detective Doyen, on the other hand, did not hold grudges against anyone in this case, and he continued on his focused investigation. Doyen called in search dogs to examine the area, but they did not find anything either. The discovery of Misty's pants, 
only served to amp up Corey's confidence in his investigation, and he began to see himself as the sole force keeping this case alive. Although Randy Oxiger had long ago been cleared as a suspect in this case, Corey was still convinced, convinced that Randy had killed Misty and that Randy was the Green River Killer. During this time, Diana's opinion of Corey began to vacillate, and she began suspecting him of having ulterior motives. In Diana's mind, she could not reconcile how Corey had an eerie ability to uncover evidence in the case, while no one else could. And Diana could not figure out why Corey was so obsessed with Misty's case. Could the two things be connected? Corey Boper did have some selfish motivations as Misty's case moved forward. His impending sentence for drug charges was fast approaching, and Corey hoped that his cooperation with investigators on this case would earn him leniency during his sentencing. But that would not be the case. During Corey's sentencing hearing, several police officers testified against Corey and painted him in a negative light in the eyes of the court. Because of this, Corey received a 14-month jail sentence, and while Corey served his 14 months in jail, Misty Copsey's case sat cold on a shelf, with no progress in those 14 months. While Corey Bober sat in a jail cell, Detective Coble visited Corey in jail. He asked Corey to continue helping in the Misty Copsey investigation by handing over his extensive files on Randy Oxiger. Corey vehemently refused this request. Now Corey, who was once the most emphatic civilian investigator in the Misty Copsey case, wanted public recognition for his exhaustive efforts to bring Misty's killer to justice. While Corey sat in jail, Detective Doyen kept pursuing new leads in the case, and he caught a breakthrough while interviewing Misty's best friend, Trina Brevard. While interviewing Trina, Doyen showed Trina a photo of Misty's recovered jeans. At the sight of this, Trina began to cry. And through these tears, she began to disclose valuable information that no one involved with this case had yet to hear. Trina told Detective Doyen that the girl's plan all along that night was to get a ride home with Reuben Schmidt. But this is not what had happened. Instead, on the night of the fair, when Misty called Reuben, he did decline to come pick up the girls. Trina reiterated Reuben's claim that he did not have enough money for gas to go pick up the girls. Misty continued trying to persuade Reuben to pick them up, even giving him instructions on how to sneak into her own house to get money for gas. But still, Reuben had refused. Trina also admitted that she did not care for Reuben and was thinking of declining the ride if he had come to pick them up. Trina's story from there mostly aligned with the story Diana had told investigators. Around 8.30 p.m., the two girls went their separate ways, and Trina walked back to her home in Sumner. Trina told the detective that they had not encountered anything strange at the fair. There were no boys hitting on them, no one following them around. It was just a normal night out. The next movement in the case came after the show America's Most Wanted aired a segment about Misty's disappearance. Tips were directed to the Puyallup Police Department, where Sergeant Carver was still holding jurisdiction over the case. Carver attempted to use these new leads to distract Diana from Corey Bober, who was gaining a reputation as an informant while in jail. But Diana would not be swayed, and she advised Detective Carver to work a little harder, and she suggested, once again, that he look into Reuben Schmidt, the person she held the most suspicion over. Now, we know that the police hate being told what to do, 
and Carver was specifically difficult to deal with. However, maybe just to shut up Diana, he decided to finally look deeper into Reuben Schmidt's history. And there, he made some disconcerting discoveries. Reuben worked at a restaurant called Adam's Ribs, and Carver went to the restaurant and spoke with the owner, Frank Rodriguez. Frank had a lot to say about Reuben, specifically that Reuben had spoken a lot about Misty Copsey including one time when he stated that he knew the exact location of Misty's remains. Frank said that Reuben claimed that her body was buried about six miles from where her clothes had been discovered. Carver and his partner were still at the restaurant when Reuben arrived for his shift. At the sight of the officers, Reuben fled on foot. He was apprehended a few hours later and brought into the police station for an interview. While Carver interviewed Reuben, Reuben dismissed his previous statements about Misty's remains, explaining that this was his immature attempt to get his boss off of his back. Reuben went back through his story of the night of the fair, and his story lined up with what Trina had also claimed happened on that night. One noticeable thing to emerge from this interview was Reuben's claims that he suffered from occasional blackouts. During these blackout periods, Reuben was not asleep. He simply could not remember what happened during these periods. After Misty's second call on the night of the fair, the call in which she asked Reuben to go to her house to obtain money for gas, Reuben experienced one of these miraculous blackout sessions, and he could not remember anything that happened until the next morning had arrived. When Reuben awoke the following morning, he got up and drove his own car to his grandmother's farm property in Buckley, even though he had no money for gas to drive that far. This farm property was located just eight miles from where Misty's jeans would later be discovered. When asked about this trip, Reuben stated that he did not know why he drove there and that no one was home, so he left quickly after arriving. Sergeant Carver still did not believe that Reuben was the suspect Diana imagined him to be. However, he did give Reuben a polygraph test. During this test, Reuben continuously attempted to make himself fall asleep. This is a known tactic used by some to try and beat a polygraph test. This tactic raised concerns with the officers but they never pursued any further inquiries into Reuben Schmidt. It was reported back to Diana that Reuben had passed his polygraph test with flying colors, even though they knew that this was a lie. Because the police had all but cleared Reuben in the case, Diana refocused her attention on Randy Oxiger, Corey Bober's chief suspect. Diana began to harass Randy, a mother still desperate for answers. After a few months passed, Frank Rodriguez called up Diana directly. The manager from Adam's Ribs told Diana about the things Reuben had said about Misty, something the police had not shared with her. The Secret Sits will return in just a moment. In 2007, a sinister underbelly emerged beneath South Florida's sunny exterior. A series of heinous crimes, all originating at the posh town center mall in Boca Raton, sent shockwaves through the community. I'm L.A., host of Perpetrator Unknown. I've watched these horrific cases unfold over the past 16 years. Join me as we journey into the heart of these mysteries. We'll review the facts of each case piece together evidence, and explore the lives forever altered by the events we'll uncover. Perpetrator Unknown. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. This placed Reuben right back on top of Diana's suspect list, and it further eroded Diana's trust in the police, specifically Sergeant Carver. During the investigation, Reuben decided to get rid of his car, 
1974 Chevy Nova. But he did not simply sell his car to a new buyer. Oh no. Rubin sold his car to a local scrapyard who crushed and processed the car beyond recognition. Rubin's reason for selling the car has never been disclosed. The next significant event to happen in this case came once again from Misty's best friend, Trina Brevard. Trina once again spoke to police, and this time she revealed that she had not actually walked home that fateful night. Instead, she had gotten a ride home from her 23-year-old boyfriend, Michael Reiner, who picked her up at the fair. Michael Reiner had somewhat of a dubious past. When he was 16 years old, he was accused of raping an 11-year-old girl, whom he had offered a ride home in his car. Michael also had a personal connection to Kim Delange and Anna Chebetno, who had been found dumped on the side of Highway 410. Sergeant Carver was still declaring Misty as a runaway, King County Detective Doyen decided to continue investigating Michael Reiner. During subsequent interviews with Trina, she revealed that she had withheld information about Michael out of fear. She stated that on the night of Misty's disappearance, she had called Michael for a ride, but Misty was hesitant to accept a ride from him. She did not trust him, period. Doyen speculated about the events of that evening, Could Michael Reiner, who knew that Misty did not have a ride home, circle back after dropping off Trina and pick up Misty with ill intent? Trina could not be sure, as Michael had dropped her off at home that night and immediately left her house. As April arrived, police learned that Michael was attempting to sell his car, a blue 1981 Ford Escort. An undercover police officer posed as a buyer and purchased the car, and then it was brought in for forensic testing. After this testing, analysis reports cleared Michael of involvement in this case. Corey Bober was still in jail, serving his 14-month sentence and sharing a jail cell with Joseph Duncan. Joseph Duncan was a serial killer in jail for multiple heinous murders, rapes, and stalking. While in jail, Corey's fellow inmates gave him the moniker the Green River Killer due to his unbridled obsession with the case, even while in prison. The intense environment of prison, along with Corey's obsession over the Green River Killer, began to deteriorate Corey's mental state. Corey set out on a letter-writing campaign. He scribed letters to his parents, Diana Smith and Detective Coble. Coble expressed his concerns that Corey would likely become mentally unwell in prison, and his fixation on the case was only exacerbating this problem. Corey received word that his chief suspect in the Green River Killer case, Randy Ogsager, had been arrested for molesting two seven-year-old girls, but this did little to sedate Corey's lust for justice, and he forged on in his attempt to connect Randy to the Green River Killer case. At this point, police had refocused their efforts on Reuben Schmidt. It had now been one year since Misty Copsey enjoyed a night out at the fair and then disappeared without a trace, save for a couple of pieces of clothing. September 1993, the Puyallup Police Department held on to their initial idea that Misty was still living, breathing, and a runaway. But the pressure was on to find some new evidence in the case, and they turned their attention back to Reuben. Police interviewed James Tensley. This was Reuben's teenage roommate at the time of Misty's disappearance. James recalled the events that took place one year ago, on September 17, 1992. James told the investigators that the night of the fair, Reuben had a 13-year-old over at the house. When Misty called asking for a ride, Reuben's 13-year-old girlfriend became upset and jealous, 
and she left shortly after the call. After she had left, five to ten minutes passed, and Reuben also left the house. He did not return until midnight. This intrigued investigators because it completely washed away Reuben's alibi for the night in question. James also told the investigators that Reuben had a short temper. He was definitely sexually attracted to Misty, and he did not think it was out of the realm of possibilities for Reuben to commit murder. Based on this new information, detectives picked Reuben up for further questioning. They also requested an additional polygraph test. Reuben was hesitant at first, but eventually agreed to take the polygraph test. During this interview, Reuben's story had some slight alterations. He claimed he drove to his grandmother's property during one of his blackout sessions, not the following morning. Other than this, his story was pretty much the same. This time, Reuben did pass the polygraph test without attempting to thwart the results. His car was no longer available for forensic testing, and so Reuben Schmidt was released by the police, and he would never be questioned about Misty Copsey again. After Reuben was eliminated as a potential suspect, Sergeant Carver did the classy thing by then focusing on Diana, Misty's own mother, as a potential suspect. Carver had Diana come down to the police station, where he subjected her to a polygraph test of her own, and then conducted interviews with Diana's former parole officer and her ex-boyfriends. Diana did actually pass the polygraph test with flying colors. However, Carver continued to lambast her and alleged that she was being dishonest to the other detectives working the case including King County Detective Jim Doyen. Carver was now convinced that Diana, along with her accomplice, Corey Bober, had planted those jeans, socks, and underwear along Highway 410. Sergeant Carver also focused attention on Corey Bober, who was now out of jail and on a work release program. Corey was scheduled for a polygraph test in March of 1994, but he did not show up for the appointment. Corey, understandably, did not trust the police, and he thought the test would only be used to falsely incriminate him in the case. The following years saw little progress. The Puyallup Police Department continued their oration that Misty was simply a runaway, despite the fact that there had been no sightings of her, nor any contact from anyone she knew. Once again, in 1997, Corey Bober was brought in for charges of dealing marijuana. Corey fought these charges as he believed they were simply the police department's way of silencing his voice. And after a two-year battle, Corey won the fight. After this battle, Corey continued fighting and fighting until he was finally able to obtain the forensic results from Misty's pants which had been analyzed four years ago. The report stated that the pants had the presence of hairs, fibers, and three red paint chips. This discovery excited Corey because he knew someone who drove a red car, a Porsche to be exact, Randy Oxiger. I want to take a moment to go back to Robert Leslie Hickey. Hickey was convicted of raping the 15-year-old girl in 1993, for which he served five years of his seven-year sentence. In May of 2001, Robert Hickey approached a 24-year-old woman who was walking home from the evening service at her church and propositioned her. The woman refused Robert's advances, Robert shouted at her from inside of his car, and she kept going on her way. Robert pulled over and exited his car, approaching the woman and asking her for a cigarette. The woman crossed to the other side of the street, and while doing so, she pulled out her phone and began dialing 911. 
Robert Hickey shoved the woman off of the sidewalk and down an embankment. He then clambered down the embankment, intent on sexually assaulting the woman. But as he approached her, he saw the display on her phone, actively calling 911. He grabbed the phone and fled the scene, saving the woman from being sexually assaulted. This woman immediately notified the police, and Robert Hickey was arrested and subsequently convicted of attempted second-degree rape. Due to Robert being a repeat offender, he received a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. So let us take a lesson from this brave woman. Cross the street when you're uncomfortable with strangers around you. I've done it myself. And call 911 before you are assaulted. If you call 911 because you are afraid and nothing ends up happening, that's fine too. But stay vigilant. Due to Robert Hickey's proximity to where Misty Copsey disappeared, and his history as a brazen serial rapist. It raises questions as to his potential involvement in her case, as well as the cases of the other two women who had been found on the side of Highway 410. Remember that Robert Hickey also drove a red Camaro at the time of Misty's disappearance, and Misty's pants had those three red paint chips. Possibly, Robert Hickey should still be a suspect in this case, and many believe he was involved. 2001 also ushered in a significant breakthrough for the Misty Copsey case in the form of the arrest of Gary Ridgway. Now, I know that all of you true crime buffs know this name, but for those who do not, Gary Ridgway was the actual Green River Killer. Gary Ridgway provided extensive confessions and admitted to dozens of murders, 49 in total. Detective Doyen played a significant role in apprehending the Green River Killer, but Corey Bober would not believe it. He still believed that Randy Oxiger was the true Green River Killer and that Gary Ridgway was being used as a scapegoat. He was the easy suspect for the police to pin the murders on. There ended up being no connections between Gary Ridgway and the two girls found murdered in Puyallup, Washington. Gary Ridgway did offer his cooperation and assistance in locating the burial sites for many of his victims, a completely selfish act taken only to avoid the death penalty. Now, Let's just debunk Corey Bober right now, so you do not go down some rabbit hole after listening to this episode. On September 17th, 1992, the day Misty Copsey went missing from the Washington State Fair, Gary Ridgway was on the clock working the whole day at his regular job, giving him a pretty airtight alibi. In the year 2000, Misty Copsey was legally declared dead by her mother, Diana Smith. A funeral was held at the Parkland Church with flowers donated by local flower shops. Corey Bober rallied the media to make the funeral a significant event in honor of Misty's memory. After this, Corey continued in his pursuit of the truth and asked the police to test the red paint chips found on Misty's pants against the red paint from Randy Oxiger's Porsche. Eventually, police did test the paint samples against one another, but they came back as inconclusive. While these testings were taking place, the three paint chips found on Misty's pants erroneously went missing while being transferred between the police evidence locker and the forensic testing company. They have simply vanished, not unlike Misty herself. The forensic testing company, Microtrace, reported a laboratory fire in 2008. Could this have been what happened to the paint chips? To this day, no one knows the truth. Sometime in the early 2000s, Diana hired a private investigator to dive deeper into this case. However, this P.I. never uncovered anything of significance. At the end of his investigation, he gave Diana one piece of advice. 
she needed to distance herself from Corey Boeber completely and sever all ties to him. I will say that Corey Boeber, for all of his eccentricities and obsessive compulsive actions around this case, he was never investigated as a suspect himself. The night of Misty's disappearance, Corey had been involved in an altercation with one of his neighbors. Police responded to this altercation around 1.30 a.m., which also provided Corey with an airtight alibi. Also worth noting is the fact that Corey Bober has never owned a car, nor has he ever obtained a driver's license, even to this day. This also greatly diminishes the likelihood that Corey could have been involved in any abduction. In 2013, the hairs found on Misty's belongings were tested, but they did not match anyone in Misty's orbit or any suspects in this crime. In 2015, a posting in the Bizarre Daily News claimed to be written by a relative of Ruben Schmidt. The post alleged that Ruben and his uncles were responsible for Misty's disappearance, but further investigation into this claim has not yielded any new leads or information. Diana Smith has taken her own life back, and she no longer speaks to Corey Bober. Corey continues to make claims on social media about this case, including his dogged claims that Randy Oxiger killed Misty Copsey and that Randy is the reincarnated spirit of Alistair Crowley, an English occultist, philosopher, and magician who lived from 1875 through 1947. These claims have not been taken seriously by law enforcement. To this day, Diana Smith has never given up hope that Misty's case will be solved. She has made appearances on shows like Crime Stoppers in her continued efforts to generate new leads or gather new information so that someday, somehow, she might learn what happened to her daughter after that joyful night out at the fair. We dance round in a ring and suppose but the secret sits in the middle and knows. Today's episode of The Secret Sits was researched and written by the host, John Dodson. All episodes are engineered and mixed by me, Gabriel Dodson. Check the show notes for links to all of our social media. Email us at thesecretsitspodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts.